To provide your input or ask a question about the key transportation decisions to be made for fiscal years 2021-2022, please email sfmtabudget at sfmta.com, call 415-646-2222, or tweet at sfmta underscore m-u-n-i and hashtag SFMTABUDGET. 欢迎参加交通局网上公开会议讨论预算事宜。如果要发表意见或就二零二一至二零二二年预算和相关的交通运输重要抉择提出问题，请电邮至 SFMTA Budget at SFMTA dot com， 致电四一五六四六二二二二。或推特 at sfmta muni hashtag sfmta budget。maligayang pagdating sa sfmta online budget open house upang maibigay iyong input o tanong tungkol sa mga pangunahing decision sa transportasyon na gagawin para sa taong dalawang libot dalawang put isa hanggang dalawang libot dalawang put dalawa mangyari mag-email sa SFMT budget at sfmt.com o tumawag sa 415-646-2222 o mag-tweet ng at sfmta underscore muni or hashtag sfmta budget. Bienvenidos a la Casa Abierta Digital sobre el presupuesto de la Agencia Municipal de Transporte. Para proporcionar sus ideas o hacer preguntas sobre las decisiones claves de transporte que se llevarán a cabo para los años fiscales 2021 a 2022, por favor de enviar un correo electrónico a sfmtabudget@sfmta.com o un tweet a arroba sfmta guión bajo m u n i hashtag sfmtabudget Good evening. I'm Jeffrey Tumblin, San Francisco's Director of Transportation, and welcome to the SFMTA Budget Online Open House. I know that this is a very difficult time for all of us、uh, as the Corona. Virus situation unfolds.、Um, we're all thinking about how do we keep ourselves and our families safe, how do we deal with our children at home, and how to prepare for the financial consequences that are unfolding all around the world. And I'm very grateful、um, that you've joined us at this time. We understand the the challenge of having a budget conversation given everything else that that is going on. And yet, in order for government services to continue, government agencies need to have a budget. Um, we're mandated by the San Francisco Charter to submit a budget to the Mayor of San Francisco、uh, and the Board of Supervisors by May 1st. And our budget team has been working really hard for the last three weeks,、uh, three months rather, to develop a budget that is rooted in this agency's values.、Uh, we understand that even if the Mayor decides to use the emergency declaration to extend the deadline of our budget, that we still need an adopted budget as a reference point. For making the necessary service and financial cuts that will have to happen as the global financial disaster unfolds, we need a starting place for this conversation, and that starting place needs to be rooted in our values.、Um, on the one hand, the details of our wonkish budget may seem unimportant given everything else that's going on around us,、um, but at the same time, public transit is continuing to play an essential role and will so for months. Uh, it, it is on public transport that our essential workers get to work, that our residents get access to essential services,、uh, and it's also our parking systems and our bikeway systems and all of our other programs that allow essential work to continue, even as we deal with this significant public health and、uh, financial crisis. So tonight, what we're trying to do is to take our public engagement process online so that we can hear from you. Understand your concerns and your questions.、Uh, 
Uh, over the last three months, we would already completed hundreds of community engagements, um, and we still know that we need additional engagement in order to finalize our budget, even though uh, public comment so far has resulted in significant changes to our original proposals. Um, so I'd like to continue that dialogue, but first I want to introduce my uh, colleague, Victoria Wise, who is here is going to help me facilitate this meeting. Um, Vic, do you want to go over some of the details we've established to help people engage online? Yeah, thank you, Jeff. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, this open house is being broadcast on our website. You can find it on our Twitter page, on our Facebook page, as well as on our YouTube channel. And you can also watch it on Channel 26 and SFGov TV as well. And then if you do not have access to the internet, you're welcome to use a phone bridge. That is 415 646 2800 and the code for that is 97556683 pound. The links to all of these social media channels can be found on SFMTA's website sfmta.com slash budget. Also just to share with everybody the recording of this hour and a half will be available on our website so if you weren't able to join us at this particular hour you will be able to view the video later and of course can continue to submit your comments. So just um, to share with you the way that we're going to do this is for the next uh, 13 minutes or so we're going to share with you a pre-recorded video that Jeff recorded just a couple of days ago to share with you some of the key details about our budget, share with you some of the challenges that this agency is facing, and then dive into a couple of details that we heard a lot about as it relates to fares, for example. We'll play the video, and then once you have an overview of what our proposed budget is, we'll come back live and work through some of the comments and some of the questions that we will be getting from you on various social media channels. So while you're watching the video, or even any time during the next hour and a half, please share your thoughts with us. You can leave us a voicemail at 646-2222. We'll be, we'll be picking those up as we go along. You can, of course, tweet us at SFMTA underscore Muni. Please hashtag that with SFMTA budget. You can email us at SFMTA budget at SFMTA.com. Folks are checking that email constantly live as we're here together. And then leave a comment on our Facebook page. So lots of different venues for us to engage in this digital dialogue, and we appreciate you bearing with us as we try something totally different in terms of public participation. The other thing I want to share with you is that please feel free to share your comments in Chinese and or Spanish. We have translators standing by. They will translate your comments and our questions and we'll send them to Jeff and I. We unfortunately can't answer in Chinese or Spanish, but uh, staff will be getting back to you via email or voicemail, whatever medium, in the language that you leave the question in with some specific answers. So, without further ado, let's watch the video. Hi, I'm Jeff Tumlin, San Francisco's Director of Transportation. Our agency is working on our next two-year budget, which is the ultimate reflection of our agency's values. These values include running a safe, equitable transportation system, reducing our carbon footprint, and creating a welcoming workplace that delivers excellent customer service. These goals are important, and we're making progress on operationalizing these values. But I also want to acknowledge that we're coming up short on several key issues. These include Street safety, muni. Okay.
Good evening. As you can see, we're having some technical difficulty showing the video. So I'm going to do my best completely off the cuff trying to remember what I said when we recorded that 15-minute video. One question, though, that I have for the crew is, is it possible to show any of the slides that were embedded in the video? Because there's a huge amount of data. Um, in any case, for those of you who are listening at home, um, the entire content of this, the, uh, the PowerPoint presentation that we were going to show you, uh, those details are all available at www.sfmta.com slash budget. Uh, if you go and look at the materials there, um, and perhaps somebody could tell me exactly where to look, um, uh, all of the material that we were referencing, including the details around our different proposals for fares, um, as well as the detailed proposals for cuts, as well as the detailed proposals for new services, can all be found there. In the meantime, I'm going to try to walk you through um, some of the highlights of those, pro those programs. And please bear with me, uh, because uh, because this is live TV, uh, and, uh, and we, were, uh, we were not prepared to do this. So one of the first things that I want to say is that the most powerful statement of any agency's values is its budget. Um, the budget is a reflection of how we spend our money. It, it is about making decisions about what gets funded and what does not get funded. The budget also must contend with incredibly difficult trade-offs. And one of the things that we've tried to do in creating this budget is to be very clear about what our agency's values are in order to help us address those inevitable trade-offs. For this budget, the most difficult trade-off that we are facing, uh, given our serious financial constraints, which have become even more serious in the last week, is the trade-off between do we reduce or keep fares constant or do we improve service? Or, or phrased a different way, do we, uh, do we cut fares or do we cut service? Or really phrased even a different way is, do we keep fares the same or cut service given the reality of our budget? So I want to talk a little bit about our values. One of the things that we value a great deal is system safety. Here in San Francisco, uh, there are about 30 people who are killed as a result of traffic violence every year, and about 3,000 are injured. Um, we're also pivoting our entire organization to focus more substantively on social equity. This means uh, uh, something very different than providing equal service to all San Franciscans, but instead it means prioritizing better choices for people who have the fewest choices. In many, many ways for us, this means prioritizing the delivery of public transit service, particularly to the neighborhoods uh, where uh, people either face uh, 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 poor access to employment or inadequate access to schools or other critical services. This particularly means uh, prioritizing access to neighborhoods that have been historically underserved, like neighborhoods um, in districts 10 and 11, uh, particularly districts where we see high levels of uh, residents of people of color um, and also uh, people living, living in poverty. Another core value of ours is, uh, is decarbonization of the transportation economy. Here in San Francisco, uh, transportation is well over half of the city's carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gas emissions. And it's the only source of carbon emissions um, that is growing rather than shrinking. As many of you know, uh, as the economy has uh, previously improved up until uh, last month, um, the uh, congestion and vehicle miles traveled, um, as well as the rate of driving um, have increased, and all of that has resulted in an increase um, in greenhouse gas emissions. Um, another core factor that we're contending with in our budget, bring up this, uh, as congestion rises and as uh, the rate of driving rises, is that as more people drive, our streets move fewer and fewer people uh, in a given year. That, uh, it's not that I'm necessarily a better person when I ride my bike or I take the bus, but I do take up one-tenth of the space as when I drive a car or ride in the back of a lift. So in order to accommodate San Francisco's significantly growing population and job space, it's very important that we manage our streets for the movement of people rather than the movement of vehicles. This means prioritizing the most space-efficient forms of transportation, which incidentally are also the forms of transportation that are most used by low-income people um, and most environmentally friendly. 
Another key factor that we face, if you can go to the next slide, um, is the reality of our structural deficit. Um, in San Francisco, like in almost all municipalities in California, our expenses rise with the cost of living, but our revenue rises basically with inflation. So in an up economy, the SFMTA faces a widening structural deficit. And there are many complex reasons in the tax code about why this is true, uh, but it's the reality of our agency. And in fact, we face a $66 million structural deficit uh, as of a month ago, a deficit that is significantly widening um, in, the, in the face of the current economic crisis. Um, in order to be able to deliver the existing service that we provide, we need more revenue. Um, in order to deal with our financial reality, um, we either need to find a means of bringing in new revenue or we face service cuts. And if you can go to the next slide, um, you can see maybe the previous slide. There we go. Uh, you can see how our revenues are tracking year over year for different sources uh, of revenue. Um, as a result, partly of Uber and Lyft, um, our parking uh, fee and fine revenues have been declining over the years um, as parking demand declines. Similarly, uh, as, um, uh, as we've expanded um, our free and discount fare programs for Muni, even though our ridership is doing well, um, our fare revenue is in, in slight decline. All of this has meant that San Francisco, the um, San Francisco MTA is increasingly dependent upon general fund revenue, which is very susceptible to changes in the economy. So the general fund uh, is very susceptible to changes in the sales tax rate and for uh, revenues like the hotel tax, all of which are rapidly declining um, in these economic times. Next slide, please. Um, all of this uh, is covered, uh, uh, are the, uh, these core issues were covered by a group of uh, San Franciscans and experts in transit from all over the country that convened over the last six months called the Muni Reliability Working Group. Um, this group gave a rather uh, brutal audit of the Muni service um, and gave us very, very specific recommendations about how to improve the efficiency of the system and put the agency on a stable financial footing in order to allow us to deliver on the transit uh, service that San Francisco needs as it continues to grow uh, in its economy and its population. Um, these recommendations are more important than ever given the current um, economic and public health situation. Um, however, um, our budget does not include any of their recommendations uh, for expanding service. Instead, Despite the financial catastrophe that is upon us, we do want to implement the recommendations um, that the Muni Reliability Working Group gave us around stabilizing um, service and improving on the reliability, allowing us to become more efficient. Next slide, please. Um, the Muni Reliability Working Group recommendations were really bold and specific and targeted improvements around the transit lines that need it the most uh, many of which are in the outer neighborhoods of San Francisco, including service to lines like the 29 that serves the whole southern half of the city, uh, running up Sunset Boulevard um, all the way into the Richmond District, and which serves um, over 17 schools and other educational institutions. It is a workhorse route of the southern and western neighborhoods, and our, and, their, and our recommendation was to invest in um, rapid improvements on this line in order to meet the increasing demand for service in all of those neighborhoods. Um, we will not be able to move forward with any of those service improvement or equity recommendations, even in our original uh, 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 state of the budget, without a new source of revenue, which would require a vote of the public. Next slide, please. We also know that where we have invested in better safety improvements, we've seen um, significant positive outcomes. Uh, where we've invested in muni speed and reliability improvements, like on the Five Fulton Corridor or on the Nine San Bruno, we've seen ridership improvement as much as 60%. Where we've invested in safety improvements, like on the El Terraval platforms, uh, on Turk Street, uh, and on other corridors, 
Um, we've seen dramatic reductions uh, in crashes, including the complete elimination of injury-related uh, crashes uh, on the uh, places where we've made improvements on Terrebelle Street. So if SFMTA has the resources that we need to make improvements, we are capable of making dramatic improvements uh, in the quality of service um, that all San, Francisco, all San Franciscans experience um, in the transportation system. Next slide, please. So our budget included a five-year capital program that focused on a hundred or really a thousand small improvements on many of our higher ridership muni lines called the Muni Forward Program. For more detail on all of those projects, you can Google Muni Forward SFMTA for a great deal more information. Um, or see the detailed capital budget program um, at sfmta.com slash budget. You'll also see on the budget page the details of our Vision Zero and major streetscape projects um, that sought to uh, complete a protected bikeway network across San Francisco, and more importantly, make major investments for pedestrians on all of the corridors in San Francisco that experience the highest rate of pedestrian crashes, and particularly pedestrian fatalities. Um, car versus pedestrian uh, fatalities continue to be the highest cause of uh, fatalities, of transportation-related fatalities in San Francisco. Our capital plan also includes investments in state of good repair. Uh, we have parts of the system that have been neglected for decades. Um, they require significant investment in order to improve the reliability of the system, including ongoing upgrades in the subway tunnel. Um, and finally, our capital program includes um, significant improvement to our light rail system, completing the purchase of new Siemens light rail vehicles that again would um, expand the reliability of our subway system um, and continue advancing the major improvements that we've made uh, in speed, reliability, and comfort on the bus system. Next slide, please. Um, we have, uh, even in this current financial crisis, um, we will likely continue to have access to a significant amount of capital funding. We are not able to use this money for transit service operations, but we can use it to advance our core priorities like social equity and safety. So we're targeting those investments to the neighborhoods that have been most neglected and to safety and service. Um, this includes, again, advancing our Vision Zero network, uh, focusing, for example, the ride hill tax, the Prop D tax on Uber and Lyft, uh, to advance a quick build program uh, that focuses on safety outcomes, um, along with uh, advancing an educational campaign um, aimed at all users, but particularly motorists, in order to improve safety outcomes. Next slide. So the most controversial topic that we have to contend with in this budget is our bus fares uh, and muni fares uh, for the entire system. Um, as many of you know, the SFMTA has a policy called indexing. Um, and what this means is that every year we raise fares by a specific percentage. And that percentage is basically the average of the cost of living um, and inflation um, so that our fares rise with the cost of delivering service. If we didn't increase fares with the cost of delivering service, we would need to cut service in order to accommodate fares being the same. And then we would end up in a service and financial crisis that would require us to periodically uh, implement a huge increase in fares that would be uh, very painful for all of our customers. So in order to avoid both the service crisis as well as the every five year huge increase in fares, we've decided instead to impose relatively modest increases in fares um, each year. Uh, we have heard a lot on this topic, um, including many calls for free muni for everyone, or free muni for certain classes of people, or to cap all of our fares given the reality of the financial crisis that all of our riders are facing that has worsened today. There are some challenges, however, uh, to stopping a fare increase in that it impacts our ability to deliver service. Um, one of the things that is quite clear about the San Francisco system is that even though there is what we call a price elasticity of demand for fares, that uh, to a certain degree ridership declines as we increase fares, the elasticity of demand for service is far greater. That is to say that if we cut service in order to keep fares the same, that the, res that the impact on ridership loss would be far greater. More importantly, 
that ridership loss would primarily be for higher income people who would simply flee to Uber and Lyft. And the lower income, more transit dependent populations would be burdened by less frequent and more crowded service. That's a situation that we want to avoid even as it pains us to try to increase fares in this economic time. So in listening very carefully to uh, the public, we've proposed some different approaches. One of the things that we've discovered is that the demographics of who rides Muni uh, varies a lot depending upon what fare product they use. People who pay with cash and people who pay single ride fares are much more likely to be low income and people of color. Whereas people who use Clipper and particularly people who use a fast pass are much more likely to be upper income and white. So looking at the demographics by each fare category, um, what we've uh, chosen to do is to recommend approaches that minimize the negative impact on our most vulnerable customers. So I'd like you to look in detail later at these graphs. The blue columns show how we would increase fares under our baseline policy of indexing. So what this says is that our $3 cash fare would rise to $3.25 in both next year and the following year. Our fiscal year starts July 1st. Um, and similarly, the fast pass would rise from $81 to $85. Um, we are no longer recommending a strict interpretation of our indexing, but have instead said we need the same amount of revenue from fare increases to match our increases in costs. But let's get to that in a more creative way. So a couple of things that we have uh, recommended. One is that we extend our free muni for low-income youth to all youth throughout San Francisco. Um, we think this is very important for a whole host of reasons. It attracts uh, young people growing up in San Francisco to transit. It also makes it uh, much easier for our fare inspectors to not have to distinguish between children who are low income versus high income. Uh, it also means that kids who forget their Clipper card uh, no longer uh, have to contend with fare inspectors. There are a lot of good reasons for extending free muni to all youth. And while this is a program that will cost us, it doesn't cost us all that much money. Similarly, we are recommending uh, that individuals who are experiencing homelessness and are enrolled in homeless programs in San Francisco also get access to free muni. We understand that these people are the neediest of folks in San Francisco and that they, like all the rest of us, need to get to their appointments uh, and their social services uh, and they require uh, public transit in order to get there. So this is a program that we feel uh, uh, very confident that we can afford. We're also proposing that for that fair media that our lowest income people use the most, which is the single ride fare, that we cap it at $3 for both next year and the following year. We've heard very loudly from all of our customers that this is quite important. Um, and so that is our recommendation both in the green column as well as in the pink column. In order to pay for that capping, however, we've got two choices. We can either, in the green column, raise the clipper pass rate slightly, or in the pink column, we can narrow the discount that single ride clipper users get uh, in order to pay their fare. Um, so uh, as you can see down below uh, in the green column, the $85 uh, monthly fast pass would rise to $88 starting July 1 in the equity monthly scenario. And similarly, the $2.50, or I'm sorry, the $2.75 uh, individual clipper fare would rise to $2.80 instead. Um, we think uh, the, this is a much more efficient way of allowing us to get the revenue we need in order to retain service, while at the same time being very conscious uh, of our neediest customers. And we'll look forward to additional feedback uh, from all of you on that proposal. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we're also making a lot of adjustments in our fine policies, uh, hearing from, again, a lot of people on this topic. Um, we know that our fine policies should be guided by our desire to get compliance in our rules in order to make the system fair and efficient. It should not be guided um, by punitive uh, objectives, and it should also be equitable across modes of transportation. 
We're a little bit constrained in how we manage our fines because many of our fines are constrained by state law. But to the extent practicable, what we're trying to do is to increase fines that are rooted in safety uh, and decrease fines that are rooted in getting uh, compliance, particularly for people who are suffering uh, from uh, financial distress. Uh, we also want to be aware that, uh, for example, uh, the fine for writing transit and taking up three square, you know, square feet of space on the 38 Geary should be less than the fine for not paying uh, at your parking meter for taking up 200 square feet of space on a San Francisco street. So we've uh, done a lot of tweaking with our fines. And again, you can find uh, all of the detail in our budget proposal. But we're uh, trying to maximize the uh, possible fine given state uh, restrictions for uh, issues like parking in a bike lane or riding a scooter on the sidewalk, while reducing fines for uh, things like um, uh, uh, you know, not, uh, not paying your muni fare. Uh, to the extent that that is, uh, uh, again, allowable according to the state law. Uh, if you go to the next slide as well. So another uh, area that's included in our budget is rethinking our approach to parking meters. Uh, as many of you know, in San Francisco, the reason we charge for parking is to ensure that motorists can find an available parking space, uh, creating availability of one or two parking spaces on every block and on uh, and in every garage and parking lot at any time of day. And that our policy is to charge the lowest meter rate that achieves that availability target. And this means that if we charge something at a higher rate, we'd end up with too many empty parking spaces, merchants would complain, customers would complain, uh, and we would also get less revenue. Similarly, if we charged a rate that was too low, all the parking spaces would be full, Merchants would complain, motorists would have to circle around the block, um, and we would also incidentally end up with less revenue. And while we don't want to be dependent upon parking meters for revenue, we want our policy to be about customer availability and small business success. The reality is we bring in revenue from our parking meters. What, uh, and so as a result, we're proposing two significant changes. One is, extending the hours of enforcement in neighborhood commercial districts, particularly those where there is a lot of restaurant and entertainment uses, we want to extend the evening hours to the extent that spaces are full in order for people to be able to drive to go to a restaurant in a neighborhood commercial district. Again, this would apply only to places where demand is high. The second thing that we want to do is to look um, at um, Sunday meter enforcement, at least in Sunday afternoons. Uh, as many of you know, our Sunday meter restrictions are rooted in an era where businesses were closed on Sunday. Now businesses are all open on Sunday, and we want to make sure that we're supporting those businesses while at the same time being very aware of the needs of faith communities. And so we're proposing to partner, uh, to partner with uh, neighborhood commercial districts and faith communities. Um, in order to uh, roll that out in a way that is conscious of everyone's needs. Um, and with that, I think we should probably, are we ready to go to questions now? We're ready to roll. All right. Thank you for accommodating our on-the-fly response there to our technology uh, uh, difficulties. Uh, we're happy now to take questions. And once again, I'd like to remind all of you uh, that there is a tremendous amount of detail that is available. Um, at uh, www.sfmta.com um, slash budget. Very good. So just um, thinking about what's going on with the coronavirus right now, Jeff, um, our economic prospects seem very dim. And obviously, the city's budget and SFMTA's budget is going to be significantly affected. Yep. Could you talk to us a little bit about how we're handling the situation, particularly in this time of uncertainty? So we're working on our budget now, and yet we don't know how our budget's going to be affected. How are we dealing with that? Yeah, I mean, this, this is sort of the craziest time to be developing a two-year budget, um, given the massive amount of economic uncertainty. In fact, the only certainty that we have right now is that our budget situation is completely unpredictable. That is also the reason why we are continuing to move forward with the budget. We need a reference point 
for uh, being able to make decisions about what needs to get cut because we know significant budget and service cuts are coming uh, and we need to be prepared for that. It's why we started this conversation about, with, uh, uh, about the budget with our values. It is only by having clarity about this agency's values that we'll be able to make solid decisions about how to make cuts in a way that minimizes damage to the agency and more importantly, minimizes the negative effects on the San Franciscans that we serve, particularly those who are most vulnerable. So uh, I, have, uh, I am not pretending that we are going to actually implement this budget on July 1. Uh, we will not have the resources to do so. Um, all of the improvements that we're planning in here, um, none of them uh, are we going to be able to just simply fund on July 1. What we need is the starting place for making the decisions about what we fund and we don't fund, and particularly how we make those cuts. Um, this is a very challenging time uh, for all of us, including um, the budget and policy wonks in every government agency, um, all of whom need to have a budget that balances. Very good, thank you. So one of the things you talked about in the slide is the fact that this agency has a structural deficit. And what I often hear from different sources is, you know, SFMTA has a huge budget. It's $1.3 billion. How is it possible that we have a structural deficit? What's going on? Can you break it down for us? <laughs> um, yeah, we've got an enormous budget. Um, we also have enormous needs that we're trying to serve. Um, I have spent my entire career in the private sector. Uh, I understand how private companies operate, uh, and I've served a lot of public agencies. Um, so I understand the, uh, how budgets work, um, particularly budgets that are oriented around providing the greatest amount of service at the least cost. One of the things that I found is that with a few very specific exceptions, um, SFMTA is actually a remarkably efficient agency. I was expecting to find a lot more waste, uh, and frankly, I have not found that. To the extent that there is waste, uh, and we found some, uh, about $5 million worth, and we're, this budget includes cuts to those specific waste categories, uh, that's about it. Um, my predecessors in weathering the 2008 recession cut all of the fat out of this program. Um, I also know, uh, having come from the private sector, that public agency budgets are driven entirely by staff costs. Um, and it takes a lot of people to run an agency of this size, uh, particularly people like bus operators. Um, they're our biggest single class of personnel, um, and they, uh, they cost a lot of money, in part because we have to pay them a living wage. Um, most of the greatest service challenges that uh, we've experienced at the SFMTA are rooted in our thousand vacancies. To the extent that we have any financial flexibility here at SFMTA, it's because of the vacancies, vacancies that exist because um, we have not been as competitive with the private sector at being able to attract and retain talent as we need to be. We have to provide our workforce a living wage um, and that's also something that I know from the private sector. Um, delivering uh, any service-oriented organization is entirely about attracting and retaining talent. So our costs are driven by wages. That also means that our cost increases are driven by wages. Uh, in order to attract and retain talent, we have to increase wages with the cost of living in this region. All of you know what it is like to live in this region and face rising rents. Um, so we've got to, again, continue to pay our workforce a living wage, which is not an exorbitant wage. At the same time, our revenues do not increase with cost of living. Our revenues increase basically with inflation. And so in a boom economic cycle, that gap between inflation and cost of living rises, exacerbating our structural deficit. Um, this is a problem that basically every government agency in California faces. Um, and it's one of the things that we are absolutely going to be having to contend with, um, given the likely financial impact of global pandemic. Um, and a third factor also is that we need to contend with growth. Um, even though we've had, a, a, like we're in an economic crisis right now, 
Over the last decade, um, San Francisco has added about 30,000 housing units um, and about 220,000 jobs. Those 220,000 jobs and 30,000 housing units have dramatically increased the need for us to deliver transit service uh, and other transportation services. And in fact, because our streets are of a fixed dimension, as the city grows, our cost per person actually increases because the work that we have to do is about making the transportation system more efficient. We can't just make the transportation system wider. So I know all of this is rather complicated, but it's really clear to me, again, coming from the private sector, um, that uh, there is not a lot of waste uh, in this pie. It's a pretty efficient pie and that we need to find a way of growing the pie in order to deliver the service uh, that particularly our neediest San Franciscans need. Very good, thank you. So now that we've covered the basics of structural deficit and why we have it, yeah. at the end of the day, our agency needs to have a balanced budget. Yep. And so you and I know that in order to have that balanced budget, we are gonna need to use some of our fund balance. Can you explain a little bit about what fund balance is and really talk a little bit about whether it's appropriate to use these funds right now in this particular economic yeah. circumstance that we find ourselves in. Yeah, so uh, so public agencies uh, basically have a savings account. Uh, it's our rainy day fund. Uh, it's a pot of money that we use uh, when we're dependent on revenue sor uh, uh, sources that go up and down. It's the thing that allows us to flatten out our budget so that we don't have to do major layoffs uh, if uh, one of our revenue sources is delayed or experiences a downturn. So we've got a fund balance uh, that is there to deal with cost overruns in our capital projects and to get us through rainy days. Uh, guess what? It is not just raining, it is um, hailing and storming outside. Um, and so now is the time to actually use our fund balance. Um, we've got to get through not just the next couple of months, but what is likely the next couple of years, depending upon how the pandemic impacts the global economy and all of the sources of revenue that we rely upon. So one of the challenges that we're facing with using the fund balance is how much do we spread that out just to keep treading water or to slow down the pace by which we need to make major service cuts? Do we do that or do we accelerate spending in our fund balance in order to generate trust with the electorate in order to go after a new funding source? Uh, something that becomes particularly challenging depending upon the overall state of the San Francisco economy. So that's one of the, the core questions that we're gonna be facing in the coming months is what should our rate of drawdown be on our fund balance knowing that our total available fund balance is about two months of payroll. Very good, thank you. So now I wanna dive uh, into the questions that we are getting online and via email. And Tony Mento is emailing us and asking that we prioritize new LRV four in our budget. Can you share uh, what we're gonna do about that and also really share with folks if we're gonna to continue to be sliding in the chairs? <laughs> Uh, yes. Um, so thanks to the Board of Supervisors last week, uh, we now have approval to move forward uh, with purchasing the next round of LRV4s, the new red Siemens cars. Uh, we're getting uh, 68 of them uh, in order to replace the Breda cars that have the reliability problems around their doors getting stuck and delaying the subway system. Um, so shifting to the new light rail vehicles um, will be uh, a significant benefit for resolving some of the recurring subway delays that all of us face practically every morning, um, given the poor reliability that we get from our older cars. We've also heard a great deal of public feedback around our new rail cars, and so uh, in addition to getting new ones, we're changing a couple of the passenger details uh, on those cars, including uh, adding uh, butt divots uh, in the, uh, the perimeter seating, um, so those of us who ride the J Church, as you know, when there's a significant grade on the train, we all end up um, getting to know each other much more uh, than we should, and that's particularly problematic. Um, I shouldn't joke about this, uh, but given social distancing. So 
the, having the little scoops in the seats um, will allow people to have some greater stability. We've also heard um, from a lot of people with a variety of disabilities, including people with spinal difficulties, um, that for them, having a few both forward-facing and rear-facing seats um, allows them to have a, a ride with significantly less um, spine or bone or muscle or neck pain. Um, so we've, uh, we've done some of those uh, changes as well as some changes to the, uh, to the, the, the handlebars and the grips uh, in order to be able to accommodate a whole variety of, uh, of requests. We're also lowering the seats by two inches uh, to help our shorter riders. We've gotten complaints from some of our taller riders uh, on that, uh, but we, so we will actually be maintaining some higher seats uh, over the wheel wells. Uh, so we're trying to balance uh, many competing objectives with our light rail purchase, purchases, and uh, I, I, I think what we're going to do is to maximize happiness, knowing that it's not possible uh, to make all of our customers happy. Oh, one other comment I know that it, we, we've also heard is, uh, is complaints about the perimeter seating in general. Um, one of the reasons why we've switched to perimeter seating, like most urban operators around the world, um, is that it actually allows us to fit a lot more people onto the trains, and more importantly, allows for better circulation on the trains so that standees or even people sitting can more easily get out and get to the doors. Um, so we know this means there are fewer seats on our trains, but room for more people and room for more maneuverability. Uh, we know that one of the biggest problems that Muni currently faces and likely will for some time is crowding on our buses. Uh, and trains, and uh, as the economy changes, we expect crowding will continue. All right, very good. So part of this budget, I know that we are doing just a tiny bit, but nevertheless, a tiny bit of service cut. So we are eliminating yep. the 83X, it's the mid-market express bus, and Sunny Jolie emailed us really, frankly, opposing this change, and she really thought that the writers, um, really need this service, and also that the 47 would have a hard time, if you would, picking up the slack, as she wrote, yep. and that the commute times would be longer. Can you talk to us a little bit about the rationale behind why we're eliminating the 83X and why it's important? So the vast majority of you probably have no idea what the 83X is. Um, it is. It was in the press a couple of years ago called the Twitter Express. It runs from the Caltrain station. Uh, over to basically the Twitter building in mid-market, uh, back and forth. It's a very short line. Uh, it runs at peak only, um, and it gets about 300 riders a day. It's, uh, I don't know if it's our absolute lowest ridership line, but it's one of the lowest ridership lines. And among our low ridership lines, it's the only one um, that has redundant service on the 47, uh, as well as a variety of other lines, including the, the T and the N lines. Uh, people can take the train into the subway straight to Civic Center Station. Um, so this is uh, an opportunity that we have um, to get rid of a line that is both low ridership and serving primarily an affluent clientele, uh, and a line that has uh, abundant other choices, um, including actually uh, taking advantage of the new protected bike lanes that we have installed um, on Townsend Street, 5th Street, Market, um, and 7th and 8th, uh, along with the scooters and bike programs that are available at the Caltrain station. Um, there are abundant uh, other alternatives available for the 83X. Excellent. So we talked uh, a lot about fares during your presentation, yeah. and I have to say that we heard from so many organizations, SOMCAN, Transit Writers Union, yeah. about fares, and we've really listened and I think addressed some of their concerns through the equity scenarios you described. Now I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about fees, yeah. because we've also heard lots and lots about fees. So Jeffrey uh, Ricker writes to us asking, what changes are you proposing to the towing fees? And then, um, Jeffrey is just wondering, how are we addressing some of the challenges uh, just around towing folks during these hard times? We've talked about towing quite a bit with the public already, yeah. and so if you can share some of the changes that we're making as a result of that public feedback, that'd be great. That's right, we've gotten uh, uh, hundreds of letters and emails uh, on the topic of towing, and we've heard some very passionate testimony at our board and at uh, many of the community workshops that we did uh, before coronavirus started. Um, towing is a uh, really, really uh, difficult topic, particularly for people who are most vulnerable. 
um, and especially people who are forced to live in their cars and who have no other place to live. Um, and so we took a really close look at our overall towing program, all of the reasons that we tow, um, as well as what are the costs and revenues that we're getting from our towing program. And actually, to my surprise, um, we lose money on our towing program. Um, our tow fees are very high. Uh, and on every tow, we lose a huge amount of money. Um, so one of the things that we're looking at is to the extent practicable uh, where it's not needed for safety um, or accessibility reasons, um, simply reducing the amount of towing that we're doing. We're asking the question on uh, streets like Pine and Bush where the parking lane is tow away at peak, do we really need that, particularly with traffic levels down so low, uh, given that that is going to continue for some time, why don't we just eliminate that um, and save some money? Similarly, um, for uh, people who are um, living in their car, certainly for the time being, um, we are eliminating towing for people who are housed in their vehicles um, uh, during the current health crisis. Um, and for our proposed budget, once we're out of the health crisis and moving forward into a, into a better economy, we still need a mechanism for being able to get rid of abandoned vehicles um, or for um, dealing with uh, uh, people who, uh, who are creating social, like actual social problems on the street uh, as a result of car encampments. Um, that said, we want to be compassionate to those people and identify locations where uh, they can uh, avoid having to live on the street uh, by instead being able to uh, make do in their vehicles. So we're proposing a couple of changes. One of those is creating uh, uh, a new uh, one-time uh, $0 fee uh, for people who are homeless who've had their vehicles towed. Um, this is important, uh, frankly, because like, we don't, we're not making any money off of this program. There may be times where we inadvertently uh, tow somebody's car uh, who's living in that car. Um, we don't need to punish them more. Um, they don't have the resources to pay. We might as well make that free. We've long also had a program uh, for having a discount tow fee uh, for people who are low income. Uh, the current low income fee is $238. We want to reduce that uh, for the, uh, 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 to $100. We want there to still be, uh, uh, you know, we don't want people to block driveways uh, or curb cuts. Uh, so we want there to be a disincentive, but we want that to merely be an a disincentive and not a means for us to make money. So we're reducing the low income tow fee from 238 to 100, um, and we're reducing the low income boot fee um, from $100 to $75. Um, similarly, we're proposing for um, other folks to make some slight adjustments to the first time tow fee. So instead of uh, about $450, it would be uh, 524. Um, and raising the repeat tow fee from uh, 537 to 574, just consistent with um, our indexing policy. Um, so basically treating uh, 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 typical income people uh, basically the same as we are today, but uh, putting in dramatic reduction uh, for low income and homeless individuals who end up having their, tow their car towed. And again, while at the same time, trying to reduce towing across the board um, except for reasons that are specifically re related to health and access to property. Very good. I want to stay with the topic of fees a little bit longer yeah. and talk, make sure that we cover and talk about taxis. Um, there's yeah. lots of things going on with taxis. Um, folks are really struggling in the industry. And so a couple of people have written to us and for example, Martin Kaczynski is asking us, why are there no funds in the fiscal year 21-22 budget for taxi services marketing? And then at the same time, another individual, Robert Hurtunian, is asking, what are, we, what are we doing to support the taxi drivers through these difficult times generally, yep. and really right now in particular, given the coronavirus? Yeah, this is, uh, um, as many of you know, a very, very difficult time for our taxi operators. Um, I feel strongly that San Francisco needs to maintain a strong, publicly regulated taxi industry um, that is positioned to compete well um, against ride hail companies like Uber and Lyft. 
Um, we are eager to resolve the current legal challenges so that we can move forward on supporting the taxi industry um, and setting it up for long-term financial success and for a whole host of reasons. One is because of the um, uh, uh, how much so many uh, of our taxi uh, operators have invested in the program as well as how dependent they are for their livelihood, but also because of the ways in which our taxi operators have gone and done so much work to provide accessible services to people with disabilities, unlike many of our ride hail companies. We are really dedicated to doing what we can in order to um, ensure uh, their success and uh, reasonable livelihood for the operators. So our budget, uh, as it currently stands, uh, includes a couple of items related to taxis. So in the five-year capital improvement program, um, there's a small item around taxi stands that includes about $30,000 uh, each year uh, for advertising. Um, we're also in coordination with uh, the advocates for uh, taxi operators um, are looking at using some of the remaining funds in our what's called our taxi driver fund to support advertising, to promote the use of taxis uh, uh, in uh, like a, as a um, uh, more labor-friendly way of, uh, of getting around the city. Um, certainly there's something that I choose when I need a ride someplace um, is our taxi service. Um, so um, right now the funds that we have are nearly depleted, um, but we've got probably about $300,000 remaining in that fund and we're trying to figure out the best way of allocating what's a relatively limited amount of funding if we tried to spread it out too, too thinly, um, but, would, uh, but which could support advertising um, if our board um, approves. Um, in the short run, we're also making sure that we are eliminating uh, driver renewal fees for the extent of the health emergency. Um, drivers can continue working out on the street without paying the renewal fees um, while we're in this health emergency. Um, it's the least that we can do in order to support our operators. Um, we're also thinking about, if we can, waive the taxi fees for the next two fiscal years, um, given the huge impact that is being felt uh, by our taxi operators. Um, so those are things that um, are under discussion outside the context of our budget, but which we would likely do. Very good. I'm going to shift my bicycle gear a little bit okay. and move on and talk um, a little bit more about the Golden State Warriors with you. So during this last fiscal year, the Chase Arena was opened and I'm gonna just say that we were very successful in that opening because this agency partnered with the Golden State Warriors and provided excellent transit service and also excellent um, traffic control and parking management and curb management, which yep. is really what we've been developing around that arena and elsewhere yep. in the city for quite some time. But one of the most innovative and really exciting things that we did is that the Muni ticket is included in the ticket of your event or Golden State Warrior game, for example. So that's been an exciting development and I think it really has facilitated folks riding transit to the events or to the um, basketball games. So how do you uh, envision maybe expanding that program? And in particular, we have um, on Twitter, someone's asking, Anais and Skywalker is asking, is MTA also partnering with the Giants, for example, to do something similar? Um, so I think the MTA should be so proud of the work that you all did. Uh, in fact, you, Victoria, were very much involved in all of the programming around the Chase Arena. All that happened before I arrived, I had nothing to do with it. I sat back and watched and was braced for a disaster, and instead it was a phenomenal what? success. So you all should be really proud of that work. Um, uh, SFMTA charges $1.50 on every Chase Center event, and in exchange for that, uh, delivers um, all kinds of services to the arena, um, and makes it possible for the arena to function with gazillions of people coming in there and without complete gridlock. It's not to say there's not a lot of crowding and issues that still need to be resolved, but still an amazing success. So I would love to expand on that, the success of that program. Um, if anyone from the San Francisco Giants is listening, um, call me. We're ready to expand uh, the success of a program like that. Similarly, um, if and when our convention center is open again for business, and it will be, um, I'd love to have every conventioneer badge also be a Muni Fast Pass. I would love the hotels to have every you know plastic hotel card key um, also be a Muni Fast Pass, and you know frankly, 
um, for all major employers in San Francisco to chip in to help us deliver the transit system that we need, particularly given the economic crisis, uh, and while at the same time having us deliver free transit to their employees. Um, as an agency, we're really eager to make some savvy deals in order to be able to maintain service um, in these times. And it's going to require really, really active participation from the private sector in order to allow us to do that. Very good. So um, one question that we get from time to time is about our crossing guard program. Mm -hmm. And in particular, one person asks, can we increase the number of hours that crossing guards wa work? So for example, the way that it is today, we have crossing guards in the morning for an hour and a half, essentially making sure our kids are getting safely to school, and then another small shift in the afternoon yep. when everybody's leaving school. Yep. So it's not a very long day, and it's spread apart, and I think a person or two are curious, yep. can we really give the crossing guards more hours? What do you think about that? Um, so I love our crossing guards. Uh, I, uh, they help me cross the street every morning on my way to Muni uh, at Harvey Milk School. Um, they provide a phenomenal amount of service and keep our kids safe. Um, in our budget, we, um, we had a choice to make about whether we expand the program to more schools or whether we expand the hours of individual crossing guards. So if we add more hours to individual guards, we serve fewer schools. If we add more crossing guards, given their current very targeted hours, we can serve more schools and enhance safety. Um, we have very much chosen the latter um, and have allocated uh, additional budget to hire about 20 new crossing guards, um, but we've not uh, expanded their hours. And in fact, in talking to many of the guards, including the ones that, um, that I see every day, um, uh, most of them live in the community. Uh, many of them are older adults. Um, and they're not, all of them are interested in more hours. Um, they actually really like uh, being able to sort of get out in the community every day. Um, so we feel that more safety for more schools uh, is going to serve San Francisco better than more hours for fewer guards. Okay, very good. So live from Twitter, a native 415 asks, what is the plan, the schedule for SFMTA to hire more supervisors in 2020? Ah, yes. Um, this is a hugely important question. Uh, and one of the questions that uh, comes straight out of the Muni Reliability Working Group recommendations. So if you want a lot of detail on that topic, um, search for Muni Reliability Working Group. Uh, and also uh, look into the detail uh, of, of our budget. So. In order to, so back in the last recession, back in 2008, uh, in order to hold on to our core service, uh, the previous administration wisely chose to slash um, supervision, line supervision, the people who are in charge of making sure that the buses stay evenly spaced out, that operators leave their terminals on time, that when there's a problem at a specific location like St. Francis Circle, there's many places in the system where we have recurring problems, that there's a supervisor there that has operational experience that knows how to sort out those problems. In order to improve reliability and in order to have steadier service, we really do need to staff up again uh, with those supervisors. Um, those supervisors can also take advantage of the investments that we've made in technology. Uh, years ago, people thought that um, all of the global positioning satellite trackers on the buses would allow us to automate supervision. But in reality, what we find is that that data requires a detailed understanding of what's happening out on the street and what uh, buses can and can't, cannot actually do. So what we're finding is that having a new array of supervisors uh, allows them to use the data that we're getting, uh, which basically is a force multiplier on the supervisors. Uh, and where we're applying the supervisors, we're getting huge increases in, uh, in reliability as well as headway maintenance. Um, so uh, I'm now forgetting the exact number of supervisors that we're hiring, budget team, do you remember? 20, 30. 20, 20 to 30. 20, yeah. So 20 to 30 new supervisors are in the budget. Um, again, it's a question about whether we'll actually be able to hire those, uh, but that's our current plan. Very good. Speaking of hiring, 
I'm getting a question from Nelson Lai. Any job opportunities offered to recent college graduates at the SFMTA? And so I'll just pipe in and say that we, of course, have an internship program um, that uh, is amazing at SFMTA. It's truly a training ground. And uh, many people that have gone through our internship program actually end up working at SFMTA. And additionally, I'll just share that really people should be looking on our LinkedIn website and on the city's DHR website. We constantly post job openings for all kinds of positions, uh, a very diverse set of positions, engineering, planning. Of course, we talked about supervisors and operators and right. analysts. So we are excited to have any college graduate. And as you alluded to earlier, it's really important to retain and to attract talent. That's right. There's a jobs portal on our website. If you Google jobs with the SFMTA, um, the jobs portal will come up. Um, and another uh, position that just opened up, uh, actually just today, I believe, is our transit ambassador program, um, which is a, a really fascinating job. Uh, it is, uh, it's for, uh, basically for entry level people, uh, particularly San Franciscans who live in um, the south, uh, southeastern uh, neighborhoods uh, to ride our school tripper services uh, in order to um, help um, uh, ensure that Muni is civil. Um, it's our alternative to what other transit agencies have, which is having a police force ride Muni. Um, instead, we train people in the community who understand the kids in their neighborhoods uh, and can engage with uh, uh, riders in order to support civil behavior uh, and to make us all remember that we're all in this together and we all need to get to work or school or shopping or whatever it is that we're doing on Muni. Very good, and I'll just offer it's not just one position. There's 13 of those yep. that we're advertising today. Yep. Yep. So another um, person from Twitter is saying, why is the fine for fare evasion in some cases more expensive than a parking violation ticket? Can the SFMTA look into the progressive fare enforcement that only requires payment of the fare? Um, yes, this is, uh, this is a huge, uh, uh, personally important topic for me. Um, it is one that um, was going to take us too long to fully resolve in our budget conversations, uh, but we're committed to doing as part of a larger program that may require some advocacy at the state level to change some of the state restrictions um, that uh, restrict our ability to manage fares. Um, it is very important to me that we look at our fare evasion program not as a way of making revenue off of citations, but as a way of encouraging people to pay their fair share. So rather than charging people fines, I would so much rather uh, people who haven't paid their fare to instead uh, be required to buy uh, a, 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 a clipper card. Uh, that would be the value of that fine, but instead gets them into the business of actually uh, of, of paying their fare, um, or instead of asking them to um, you know to pay a fine, uh, that it allows them to uh, uh, contribute their time to a community service function. More importantly, the thing that really really irritates me is that the fine for not paying your three dollar bus fare for taking up three square feet of space on the bus is greater than the fine for not paying your three, uh, our $3 parking meter to get 300 square feet of space on the street. Uh, we need to equalize uh, these fares across the impact they have on the system. So again, we're, uh, there's too much complexity for resolving all of that in this particular budget, but that is something we are absolutely committed to coming back to and revisiting uh, probably in several phases over the coming year, particularly relative to the legislative effort that we wanna have at the state to help the state government uh, with that fair uh, equity question as well. Very good. Staying a little bit more with fares, Heidi P from YouTube is writing us, do parking, permits go up by the same amount as the muni fares. Why is parking so much cheaper than a muni pass if we are indeed transit first? Jeff? Yes, so speaking of things that drive me nuts um, and that require a uh, legislative change. So our residential parking permit fees uh, are currently $144 a year. We're raising them by some tiny amount. Uh, so a residential parking permit is basically 30 cents a day to store your car uh, on public property um, in your neighborhood, uh, or at least to have a hunting license to be able to do so. 
the reason it is only $144 a year is that it is illegal for us to charge more for the residential parking permit than, we, uh, than it costs us to administer that parking program. Um, so this is really frustrating. Unlike parking meters, which we uh, have a great deal of flexibility in terms of how we set the rate, the residential parking program is fundamentally broken. And the result of that is that in our more urban neighborhoods, in the core of the city, um, a residential parking sticker is just a hunting license. It's not a useful tool for making sure that residents coming home late at night can actually find a parking space uh, near their homes. So changing that requires significant changes to state law as well as to a court decision from long ago called uh, 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 Richardson versus Arlington. I think that is what it is. So um, uh, that is also one of the program areas that we're committed to working on this year is figuring out what's the optimal way for managing parking in our residential neighborhoods that provide some reasonable assurance that our residents can find a parking space near their home at night in the rain, provides, uh, uh, makes it difficult for you know, commuters to the financial district to just park their car in the neighborhood uh, in order to avoid uh, paying in the garage. And at the same time, makes it possible for our, uh, the employees in our neighborhood commercial districts to find a place to park when they need to park that's not just uh, in front of the business across the street. Um, it's part of the complete madness of the rules governing mobility that um, look only a single mode at a time. Um, we absolutely want to think comprehensively across all modes of transportation and actually have the tools to be able to manage the entire public right-of-way in San Francisco for the public good. So again, would love to take care of that in this budget, uh, but we really can't. Uh, and I guess I should add as well, on the parking meter side, um, again, it's our policy that our parking meter rates are the lowest rate that achieves an availability target in our commercial districts. If we raised our parking rates higher, we don't necessarily bring in new revenue. So if we were to double our parking meter rates, we don't double revenue because our rates for parking actually have a much greater impact on the demand for parking than our muni fares. Um, so we're trying to have a parking meter rate that optimizes revenue and optimizes the accessibility to our commercial districts at the same time. Um, so these are some of the many things that we struggle with as we're trying to put together this budget in a way that brings in the revenue that we need and does so in a way that is equitable to um, everyone who travels in San Francisco, whether it's by car or bike or bus or mm -hmm. foot or skateboard. Very good. Okay, moving on to an email from Christopher Peterson. Um, Chris is asking, what low-cost measures will Muni undertake to improve service? For example, providing faster service can make the service cheaper to provide. Is Muni willing to give more priority to buses over cars yeah. through signal priority, for example? Chris gives that um, as an option, or to eliminate bus stops that are spaced too closely together. Yeah. I would add to that maybe doing transit-only lanes yes. and so on. Um, so this is uh, a program that I'm most excited to move forward with, uh, most of which was developed before I arrived, but that where we now have new tools to move forward really, really quickly. So this is called the Muni Forward Program. Uh, and again, you can Google that. There's a lot of detail on our website about the Muni Forward Program. But just last month, um, our MTA Board of Directors gave us authority to implement our Muni Forward Program so much faster than we'd ever been able to do before. So as some of you may know, we have this thing called the Quick Build Program. We've applied it mainly to protected bike lanes, where we go in, um, engage with the community in a given corridor, and within a couple of months, do some pilot implementation with really, really cheap, easily reversible materials, like paint and those plastic posts. So you've seen this all over the city. Um, some of it looks really ugly and kind of slapdash, in part because it's intended to be that way. What we've wanted to do is to move really quickly and cheaply and actually experiment and collect data and make adjustments as we go along. Um, this has had um, some phenomenal benefits. So in the corridors where we've made these quick build improvements in protected bikeways, we've seen huge increases in, in, in bike ridership. 
We've also been able to generate some trust with the businesses along those corridors and the residents. We've also discovered, you know, some engineering problems where, you know, like that wasn't really quite the right way to do it. And we've made adjustments in real time based upon the data. After we go through a period of evaluation and adjustment and evaluation data collection, we then make a, a report and decide whether to make um, those changes permanent, in which case uh, th there's a separate project uh, for a full-on capital project that builds things out using concrete and trees and nice materials. We want to take all of that success and apply it to Muni. We've already seen on the Muni uh, forward projects like the, what we did on the Five Fulton, um, where we did a thousand small improvements to the Five Fulton, including implementing the Five Rapid. And the result of that was a 60% improvement in ridership on the Five, which is phenomenal, and a 40% decrease in collisions on the street. Um, this was an amazing success for a relatively low cost project. That project took us a few years to implement. Um, with our new authority to do Muni Forward Quick Build, we can do many, many, many more of these projects more quickly. And we've been experimenting with that a little bit on the nine. Uh, we're still wanting to move even faster um, than we've done in the past. Um, and the Muni Forward program um, and the new uh, projects that were just approved by the MTA board on Tuesday, Tuesday. Um, allow us to move forward. Like if we have any capital money uh, and can maintain our current staffing levels, we are ready to move forward with some dramatic improvements on the Muni lines that our riders use the most. Very good. I have a very specific question from SF Streets 415 asking us when will the fair increases start? So if we get approval uh, in April for the fair changes, um, those would be in effect on July 1st. And that is assuming that uh, that uh, September we- September 1st. I'm sorry, September I am just been corrected. If we get approval on our budget on, uh, uh, in April, um, the fair changes would go into effect on September 1st. Um, this is going to give us time to actually understand what are the implications of the financial impacts of the global pandemic. Um, so again, I want to emphasize why we're wanting to approve this budget now. Um, we need a budget that is clear about its values, and we need a reference point for making changes. Our current budget um, is not very rooted in values. Uh, it's, it's, pretty, uh, it's pretty strict and straightforward and old school and references previous years. We're wanting to shift that and integrate equity policy into the budget so that when we need to make adjustments, as we will absolutely need to make adjustments given the financial realities that we're gonna be facing, that we can do so with some clear guidance about the implications of the trade-off decisions that we're gonna to have to make. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I think that's right. All right. So one very important question that's not related to the budget that we're getting, but it's absolutely critical, is from a YouTube user, T3 Exla asking, are we cleaning our buses? Yes, uh, so this is definitely a question we've been getting um, almost every day. So we're doing a couple of things. Uh, so every night when the buses, go, buses and trains go to sleep at night, um, they are thoroughly cleaned and scrubbed and, uh, and completely desanitized. We're fortunate that given all the guidance that we're getting from the Centers for Disease Control uh, and global authorities is that the virus itself is, is, is fairly delicate. It's easy to kill the virus with straightforward materials. So we're making sure that we're doing a thorough cleaning of, uh, of our vehicles every night. Similarly, we're doing a, a wipe down uh, uh, using uh, simple uh, chemicals of the high touch surfaces in our stations four times a day. Uh, as uh, the epidemic has gone on, uh, we've also begun to activate what are called disaster service workers. So all of us who work for the city, uh, one of the things that we sign is that in the event of an emergency, uh, we can be commandeered to serve essential functions. One of those functions is increasing the sterilization of our vehicles uh, during the middle of the day at their terminals when operators are taking a break. Um, I am doing my car cleaner training duty this Friday morning. Um, we feel, uh, sorry, um, we feel very strongly 
that all of us here at the SFMTA um, are in the service of the public. Um, and that we're not just going to ask uh, our maintenance crews to step it up even more than they already have. In fact, the thing that is making me most proud about serving this agency right now is the way in which our bus operators, our station agents, our maintenance crews, our communications teams, uh, our station agents, they are all here at basically a 100% level. They understand that they are in service to the public. It's my job and the job of the, uh, of the professionals at One South Venice to serve our operators and other frontline workers in this time, which means we need to step it up to provide that additional cleaning that is necessary to protect our operators and to protect our riding public. Um, so I will be serving my shift on cleaning down the vehicles uh, in the coming weeks, and I'm expecting the same from, um, from my other managers. Um, this is the time where this agency has to come together um, and to remember um, our service mission to the public and to our frontline workers. Excellent. As you can see, I, I feel a little strongly about that. Yes, uh, and, and I'm glad that you do. And, and, um, and we will be working together and we will get through this very challenging time. And so once we do, and looking a little bit into the future, yeah. I want to talk to you about and bring you back to the budget. So we've talked about the structural deficit and the fact that it's going to grow over time. And in the long term, we're going to need to think about ongoing new revenue sources. Can you talk a little bit about that What in terms of what work has been done to identify new revenue sources, what they look like potentially, uh, and what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so um, fortunately, what was it, about a year ago, the Transportation yep. 2045 work? Yep. So. Uh, it's not like our structural deficit is a new problem. Uh, we have known about this for a long time. It is a recurring problem. Uh, and again, it's a problem that all government agencies in California face. So the Transportation 2045 program uh, investigated all of the various different ways that SFMTA um, could either temporarily or better yet permanently create a revenue program that would close the gap and allow us to deliver the service that San Franciscans need. So there's a long list of those potential revenue measures. Um, one of them, uh, so San Francisco now has the authority to uh, uh, create a special vehicle license fee um, uh, that would go to transportation. Um, that's a possibility it has not pulled well. Um, here in California, the things that tend to pull the best are sales tax measures for transportation. Uh, we could consider uh, doing a special election at any time to put a sales tax measure uh, on the ballot. Um, uh, it is uh, too late for the November 2020 election. Uh, putting something in the ballot requires a huge amount of work and will also compete against other critical priorities like dealing with homelessness and dealing with um, the economic impact of the global financial changes on so many people. Um, we could go to the voters for a general obligation bond. Uh, that would be particularly useful for capital money, uh, uh, but can also, uh, to a certain degree, be used uh, for operating support. One mechanism that we're particularly interested in is called a community benefits district. Um, so this is like a mellow Roos district where um, individual property owners vote to tax themselves on their uh, property value in exchange for specific community benefits programs, which could include uh, an expansion of transit service. Um, it is one of the easier taxes to uh, talk about just administratively um, that, be, that doesn't have to be tied to a major election, and we're not going to be having a major election for a while after November of 2020. Um, another thing that has been talked about as well is um, uh, changes to the ride hailing tax. So, you know, voters uh, uh, approved Prop D last uh, November, Mart November. 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 In November. Uh, which is bringing in a fair amount of money, but um, not a lot given our needs. So one of the questions is, are there different ways of taxing ride hail? So for example, the current ride hail tax is, is basically a fee on using ride hail. Um, so it doesn't tax the way in which uh, right hill operators drive around empty, which is a very significant portion of their time. Um, another really, really important uh, uh, revenue measure that is currently under study and is arguably 
uh, if it is done appropriately, the most equitable and sustainable way of closing our revenue gap is uh, congestion pricing. Um, so this is similar to what Milan and London and Singapore and Stockholm have done, uh, which is to say that for every commodity in our society, we use price to balance supply and demand. Um, in mobility, we use time to balance supply and demand. So congestion is simply what happens when the demand for mobility equals the supply. Uh, and rather than using price to balance supply and demand, we ask people to queue. Um, and this is tremendously wasteful uh, and uh, reduces the number of people that our transportation system can, can serve. It's a, it's, a, it's a huge problem. In uh, 2013, San Francisco, the San Francisco County Transportation Authority, which is our sister agency, did a downtown congestion pricing study um, that looked at how much revenue could be raised by charging a fee to drive in and out of downtown San Francisco during the peak time. And it was very much focused on revenue. And there, it resulted in many concerns by people who said, this is just a way of taxing the poor in order to allow rich people to drive more easily downtown. Uh, and so that was not implemented. This time around, we're um, asking a very different question, which is, how can we use systematic mobility pricing in order to advance equity and in order to allow our streets to move more people? What if we thought more holistically about congestion pricing and looked at it as rent? So again, I charge $3 for two and a half square feet of space on the 38 Geary bus, um, but it's free to drive down Geary Boulevard to get downtown, particularly if your office building gives you free parking. Uh, and that is 300 square feet of roadway space. Why am I charging someone to use our roadways efficiently by making it and making it free for the most inefficient use of our mobility space? Similarly, um, for example, for a shift worker who, who works in a, in a restaurant downtown, who starts their shift at 5 p.m. and has to drive downtown at 5 p.m. because when they get off work at 2.30 in the morning, there's no transit service. It's cheaper for me to subsidize their drive trip or even their Uber or Lyft trip than it is for me to invest in better transit service at 2.30 in the morning. So how could we think about using pricing in order to improve choices for people who need the most choices and to advance equity by basically stealing from the rich and giving it to the poor rather than stealing from everyone in order to advantage the poor. So these are very complicated questions and I would encourage all of you to follow the SFCTA downtown congestion pricing study and get involved in that, particularly as economic condi conditions are changing, to make sure that as we think about mobility pricing, that we're using it in a way that advances equity makes it easier for everyone to move around San Francisco, and that values people's time, including low-income people who um, have actually the greatest time burdens. Uh, low-income people uh, are more, more likely to work multiple jobs as well as to work shift jobs. Like, I'm not fired when I'm late for a meeting. Uh, shift workers are fired if they're 10 minutes late too often for their jobs. Now, this is probably a way longer answer than you wanted, uh, but it's a, it's a question that's super important to me. Very good. Well, we are at time, so we oh. need to wrap up a little bit. Okay. But uh, I, I wanted to, I, that's okay. These are really important topics, so we want to make sure we cover them. But I wanted to thank everybody for joining us this evening and uh, really appreciate the time that you were taking to engage and to write to us questions. We know that these are difficult times and that everybody has a lot on their mind. So we're very grateful for everybody's engagement. Jeff, do you wanna offer any closing remarks? Um, the engagement that we're doing is substantive. We've gotten thousands of emails, comment cards, letters, uh, all kinds of contributions. I wanna make sure that you know that we take this, these comments seriously. Um, uh, our staff have read every single one of those comments, um, and I have read most of them myself, including all of the comments that I get on my Twitter feed, which is hundreds and hundreds. I'm sorry I don't respond to those personally, but we're taking your input seriously, and I hope that many of you see uh, the comments that you have delivered to us reflected in these changes. Again, I want to emphasize that there is no greater statement of an agency's values than our budget. 
And that's why we're trying to build values into this budget while being aware that we are in very, very difficult economic times. Our budget must balance, and we have to deal with trade-offs, particularly these very, very difficult trade-offs of between uh, fares versus service. We have hard choices to make, as I know all of you do. Um, I wish you all um, the best in these difficult times, and I hope that you stay safe uh, and that your family stay safe. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>